Hello, welcome back. In this video, I would like to discuss the topic of free speech. I'm sure many people have seen the free speech rally that took place at the University of Toronto, where Professor Peterson made an impassioned speech against Bill C-16. He defended free speech and argued against the legal enforcement of politically correct speech codes. I will address some general points surrounding the topic, which I regard as important, and I'll try and highlight what I think are common missteps in reasoning that people make when talking about issues surrounding free speech. So a good place to begin is to take a look at a small part of the speech made by Professor Peterson. Let's listen to what he has to say. Right. So there's a reason I'm defending freedom of speech. And the reason for that is quite straightforward. The reason I'm defending freedom of speech is because that's how people get their opinions, settle their opinions in a civil society. And if we do that, we do that, but we so much we can't imagine. Now here's what's happened with Bill C-16 and the surrounding legislation. Free speech is the mechanism by which we keep our society functioning. It's in, it's in the consequence of free speech and the ability to speak. People can put their finger on problems, articulate what those problems are, solve them, and come to a consensus. And we risk losing that. Now, you can say there should be reasonable restrictions on free speech, and that's the case. You shouldn't be allowed to yell fire in a crowded theater. And reasonable people can discuss and debate what those restrictions should be. But we can't debate the fact that putting restrictions on free speech is something dangerous beyond comprehension. And that's what we're faced with. Now, we've had laws passed in this country that regulate what people can say. And, sorry, what people can't say. And that's reasonable. But it seems to me that we're in danger of crossing a line with Bill C-16 and its surrounding legislation it's the first time I've seen in our legislative history where people are attempting to make us speak their language. And not the one. That's not people. That's not something that I'm willing to do. Now, the left, the radical left activists are trying to turn this into an argument about sexual politics. And it's only nominally about sexual politics. It's about language that's designed to control our freedom of expression. and many comments from friends of mine and colleagues who've been criticizing everything I say. No wonder. I don't speak perfectly. My arguments aren't perfectly formulated. And neither are anyone else's. And we have to be able to say what we have to say badly or we won't be able to think at all. And I know where that leads. I've studied totalitarianism for four decades and I know how it starts. Oh, it starts with the restriction of the freedom of speech. Yes. No. Yes. There are three main points I would like to address here. The first point he raised was in relation to how free speech is a key mechanism by which we keep our society functioning. The second important point he raised was the reasonable restrictions that we place on free speech. And the third point I would like to address is his use of the fire in the theatre quotation he used as a possible justification for restricting free speech. Let's take the last point first, that is you should not be allowed to shout fire in a crowded theatre. To address this point, I will defer to the late and great Christopher Hitchens. Fire! 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 Now you've heard it. Not shouted in a crowded theatre, admittedly. As I realise, I seem now to have shouted it in the Hogwarts dining room. <laughs> But the, the point is made, everyone knows the fatuous verdict of uh, the greatly overpraised Justice Oliver Wendell Holmes who asked for an actual example of when it would be proper to limit speech or define it as an action, gave that of shouting fire in a crowded theatre. It's very often forgotten 
what he was doing in that case was sending to prison a group of Yiddish-speaking socialists whose literature was printed in a language most Americans couldn't read, opposing President Wilson's participation in the First World War and the dragging of the United States into this sanguinary conflict which the Yiddish-speaking socialists had fled from Russia to escape. In fact, it could be just as plausibly argued that the Yiddish-speaking socialists who were jailed by the excellent and overpraised charge Oliver Wendell Holmes were the real firefighters, were the ones who were shouting fire when there really was fire in a very crowded theater indeed. And who is to decide? Well, keep that question if you would, ladies and gentlemen, brothers and sisters, I hope I may say comrades and friends, before your minds. I exempt myself from the speaker's kind offer of protection that was uh, so generously proffered at the opening of this evening. Anyone who wants to say anything abusive about or to me is quite free to do so. And welcome, in fact, at their own risk. <laughs> and, um, but before they do that, they must have taken, as I'm sure we all should, a short refresher course in the classic texts on this matter, which are John Milton's Areopagitica, Areopagitica being the great hill of Athens for discussion and free expression, um, Thomas Paine's introduction to the Age of Reason, and I would say a John Stuart Mill's essay on liberty, in which it is variously said, I'll, I'll, I'll be very daring and summarize all three of these great gentlemen of the great tradition of especially English liberty, um, in one go. What they say is, it's not just the right of the person who speaks to be heard. It is the right of everyone in the audience to listen and to hear. And every time you silence somebody, you make yourself a prisoner of your own action because you deny yourself the right to hear something. In other words, your own right to hear and be exposed is as much involved in all these cases as is the right of the other to voice his or her view. Indeed, as John Stuart Mill said, if all in society were agreed on the truth and beauty and value of one proposition, all except one person, it would be most important, in fact, it would become even more important that that one heretic be heard because we would still benefit from his perhaps outrageous or appalling view. In more modern times, this has been put, I think, best by a personal heroine of mine, Rosa Luxemburg, who said that the freedom of speech is meaningless unless it means the freedom of the person who thinks differently. Um, my great friend John S. Sullivan, former editor of the National Review, and my, I think probably my most conservative and reactionary Catholic friend, once said, uh, it's a t tiny thought experiment, he says, if you hear the Pope saying he believes in God, you think, well, the Pope's doing his job again today. If you hear the Pope saying he's really begun to doubt the existence of God, you begin to think he might be onto something. So you see, there may well be legitimate cause to shout fire, even in a crowded theatre. If we make raising the alarm illegal, what happens when there is good cause to alert others of a potential danger? Before we move on, I think it's worth taking the time to consider some basic definitions on concepts. Firstly, I think it's worth emphasising that free speech is not the primary concern here. Free speech is an ancillary right. It is derived from the natural right of freedom of expression. Why, you might ask, be so pedantic? Well, freedom of speech is only one of several ancillary rights, some of which are obviously related. The right of authors to express themselves in print and the freedom of press are obviously derived from the right to free speech. But there are less obvious rights that are equally as important, such as the right of an artist to express freely in whatever media they choose. There are complex relationships between these spheres of expression. The graphic novel, for instance, where the right of the author to use the written word melds with the visual artist's right to express themselves through the drawn or the rendered image. These two unique means of expression are often combined to produce unique works that, while challenging, often transition from subculture to mainstream media. 
History teaches us that totalitarian doctrines often seek to censure and destroy not only books, but also art and cultural representations of which they disapprove or consider subversive to their ideology. But regardless of what is being burnt or censored, be it painting, book or even comic, the intent is almost always obvious. But Professor Peterson is primarily concerned with speech and the right to free speech is incredibly important to our culture and the societies that thrive within that culture. Be under no illusion, those that seek to limit free expression undermine the pillars on which Western civilization has rested since the Enlightenment. In his speech, he rightly mentions limitation society places on the exercise of this freedom, and it is these limitations that are often the cause of some confusion. I have often heard, for instance, that free speech is allowed by the government only in relation to political discourse. This is an obvious nonsense. Or that free speech comes with consequences, which strikes me as a somewhat sinister statement to make. Freedom of expression is an individual natural right. It is closely related to the freedoms of conscience and opinion. But freedom of expression, as Professor Peterson pointed out, also has a general social benefit, in that this right is seen to be crucial for the functioning of democracy as a whole. It ensures an open flow of ideas, and is therefore a critical mechanism for holding authorities to account. The general but extremely important point is that freedom of expression, or freedom of speech if you prefer, is a precondition for the enjoyment of all other rights. You cannot assert your rights if your speech is limited. That much, at least, should be obvious. And if this much is admitted, the conclusion one has to make is that freedom of expression has a higher status than all other rights, since their enjoyment depends on the individual's right of expression. The importance of freedom of expression is not a new idea. The philosophical foundations in early modern Europe were set forth by thinkers such as John Milton and John Locke, who expressed their opposition to censorship and held the view that freedom of expression is essential to the development of democratic government and a peaceful society. Thomas Paine, perhaps the most useful Englishman ever, had cause to detest those who would seek to limit the ideas and thoughts of free peoples. Paine's philosophical position against the censorious authority of parliaments and kings was in no small way responsible for the First Amendment to the United States Constitution, which said, Congress shall make no law abridging the freedom of speech or of the press. However, it was only when human rights were written in international law that the right of freedom of expression became universally acknowledged amongst the community of civilized nations. Article 19 of the 1948 Universal Declaration of Human Rights states, Everyone has the right to freedom of opinion and expression. This right includes the freedom to hold opinions without interference and to seek, receive and impart information and ideas through any media. The European Court of Human Rights has repeatedly emphasised the importance of freedom of expression articulated in the following Article 10 judgment, which has been consistently upheld word for word in all later decisions. The judgment is as follows. Freedom of expression constitutes one of the essential foundations of such democratic societies. One of the basic conditions for its progress and for the development of every man, subject to Article 10, it is applicable not only to information or ideas that are favourably received or regarded as inoffensive or as a matter of indifference, but also those that offend, shock or disturb the state or any sector of the population, such are the demands of that pluralism, tolerance, broad-mindedness, without which there is no democratic society. We now turn to limitations on freedom of expression. Freedom of expression is not an absolute right, such as the right to life, for instance. Rather, it is a limited right or general principle recognised in international law. The authors of the conventions recognise that there may be reasonable limitation on an individual rights, 
which is why there is an abuse clause in both the UN and the European conventions. This provides that no one may use any of their individual rights to seek to abolish or limit the rights of others. In simple terms, your right to free speech does not entitle you to shout down or silence others. Such abuse is not the exercise of free speech, but an attempt to limit the rights of other people. So Article 10 contains a list of legitimate restrictions, and these restrictions are as follows. Interests of national security, territorial integrity or public safety, prevention of disorder or crime, protection of health or morals, protection of the reputation of the rights of others, preventing the disclosure of information received in confidence, maintaining the authority and impartiality of the judiciary. Well, that's quite a long list, and some of the statements are somewhat vague, perhaps deliberately so. But the points that might be of most relevance to this discussion is the reference to crime, morals, and the protection of the reputation and rights of others. The restriction on incitement to crime first, incitement to criminal acts, be it encouragement to violence against an individual or incitement to public unrest or riot, would to a reasonable person seem fairly straightforward and uncontentious. If you hold a sign that calls for the beheading of those that you perceive to be disrespectful of your profit, you are not engaged in exercising your right to free speech, but rather you are inciting others to commit a serious criminal act. Let's consider now restrictions on morality grounds. The protection of morals is a, a difficult one. Firstly, who would we trust to decide what is moral? Secondly, Morality is a subjective issue, which would deserve an entire video in its own right to, to properly address. But in general, society should be extremely wary in limiting freedom of expression on the grounds of morality. I can guarantee that everyone listening to this video will sooner or later draw a red line and seek censorship. The problem is that the lines drawn will not be drawn consistently and the consensus will vary greatly depending on the media in question. Will we restrict the spoken word or thought, or would we restrict only what can be written? And if we allow freedom of expression in written form, with no restriction, what of the visual artist who would seek to render the unspeakable in graphic detail? These are difficult questions, but I would suggest that we limit expression only when we absolutely must, not when we merely feel uncomfortable or disapproving. The protection of the rights of others is perhaps less problematic. We have largely covered this already. If you seek to limit the free expression of others, you are not engaged in free speech, but attempting to limit the rights of other people. We need not tolerate those who would limit what we can say or hear, nor do we need to tolerate the intolerant in the public sphere. By the same reasoning, we should not allow the undemocratic a place in our institutions or societies, or lend them undeserved consideration in public discourse. Lastly, I would like to turn to the topic of slander, libel and insult, which is, after all, the strapline used in the title of this video. Slander and libel can be considered under the general term of defamation. The law rightly protects an individual's reputation and standing against unfounded attacks on reputation or character. Slander and libel are not free speech, but the important point to bear in mind is that the truth of any particular statement is what defines it as defamation or not. If the accusation against the character of an individual is demonstrably true, then the public expression of such truths is protected free speech. This is extremely important because there are regressive forces at work who would have us dispose of this inconvenient touchstone. And there are even some courts in Europe that have concluded that truth of a statement is not in itself sufficient defence, which is an extremely dangerous and inexplicable position for any tribunal or court to take. Finally, we turn to insults, which you may find surprising but is actually a separate issue from that of defamation. I discussed how a defence of truth should be absolute in defamation cases, 
That is to say, if I write that some politician has fiddled his expenses, then I cannot have defamed him if this is shown to be true. But what if my statement was not a fact that could be proved or disproved, but an opinion? What if I called the politician a complete and utter prick? He or she might claim that I've been insulting, but such statements are entirely subjective. I had expressed an opinion. I had made a value judgment. There is no test available to a court that would allow it to judge the truth or falsity of a personally held belief or conviction. The European Court of Human Rights has a long-established doctrine that distinguishes between facts and value judgments. And I quote, A careful distinction needs to be made between facts and value judgments. The existence of facts can be demonstrated, whereas the truth of a value judgment is not susceptible to proof. As regards value judgments, this requirement to prove their truth is impossible to fulfil, and it infringes the freedom of opinion itself. Well, I hope we found something of interest in this video. But before we end our adventure together, I'd like to say that Dr. Peterson is absolutely right in his opposition to the intended legislation, and we should offer him as much support as we can. Either you believe in free speech or you don't. If you do believe in free speech and don't defend it, sooner or later, someone, somewhere, will take it away from you while claiming it is for the greater good. Thank you for listening. Hope to see you next time.